past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. So oh. He makes a way when the rain. Broken dreams and wasted years But tell the past to disappear Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus And all the wrong turns that you would Go and undo if you could Who could work it all for your good Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from the For all my guilty Who could care that much about me Let me tell you about my Jesus Oh He makes a way
Welcome to Vision. My name is Chris, and we hadn't had the opportunity to meet, get to serve as lead pastor here. We want to take a moment just to welcome you. If it's your first time, we'd love for you to connect with us. There's a QR code right in the seat back in front of you. If you just scan that and fill out our dis- digital connect card. And the reason that's important is because for every one of those we get today, we give $5 to our local ministry partner for the month. And for this month, it is the Raleigh Dream Center. And um, if you don't know a lot about the Dream Center, they do a lot of good works in our community. Um, They reach homeless people. They reach people who are um, strung out on drugs and addicts, uh, people in need. They every week they do a family gathering where they feed them and and, um, they do a worship night with them. They, we do a, adopt the blocks that happen twice a month um, where they go into communities and they feed um, families in need, provide them groceries. And so we partner with them. And so if you fill out that Connect card today, $5 will go to that ministry. Just want to thank you so much, church, for being a generous church. Are you glad you're here today? Yeah. I'm excited for what God's doing in our presence and what he's going to do today. And so let's go to Lord in prayer. And then we're going to continue worshiping him in song. God, thank you so much that every time, every single time we call on your name, you hear us. That you are faithful even when we are not. That even though you may be silent, You are always sovereign. Can we just sit with that for a moment, God? That for some people in this room, they've been crying out for you to do something or be something or provide something or stop something. And you're being silent and and these people are frustrated. We're, We're frustrated, but Lord, can we not, can we just realize in a moment that we are not God? 
that you are sovereign in your silence. So hear the cries of your people now. I pray this church unloads on you, (laughs) unloads their praise because you're worthy, unloads their prayers because you are God, you are Jehovah Jireh. Uh, unloads their hurts because you are Jehovah Rapha, the healer. And even in the silence, you are working. So as we sing, may it not just be lip service, but may it be from our hearts because you alone are God and you are worthy of it all. Holy Spirit, we are yours. Have your way in this house and in our hearts and in our lives. We are praying for a power today like none other. We are praying for redemption and restoration and forgiveness and reconciliation. We are praying for newness of life We are praying for restoration. We are praying for dry bones to come alive today, for revival to start in each one of us. May we not just be up here singing, but may we be worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords who is coming back one day, riding on a horse like a mighty warrior, here to take away all pain and sorrow and sadness, here to establish a new heaven and a new earth. And we ask you, Lord, come quickly. But if it's not today, if it's not today, God, then I pray that our praise and our worship would be a light and a reflection of you and your kingdom, so much so that a lost world sees a little bit of you through us. May this place look a lot like heaven. May we hold nothing back when it comes to you. May we give everything to you. May we let go of all that we're trying to hold on to, whether it be status or finances or security or or possessions or people, God. May we have open hands and open hearts and open minds to you today because you are God and you deserve it all. So have your way. And I pray this through the power of the Holy Spirit, and through the blood of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, good morning, Vision. We have a new song today, and so I'm going to open it up with some scripture. This is Psalm 23. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He lies me down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You appoint, anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is your shepherd, so let's worship him today with this next song.
that you realize that this morning, that every promotion, every acceptance into a college, every, every good gift, a wife, a husband, a child, every, a breath, of, a breath, just another breath, every good gift is from God. And I honestly believe what we magnify is what we see. And the problem is so many Christians today are looking at the problems and the deficiencies and not magnifying the blessings. We don't magnify the breath. We don't magnify that we have clothes, that we have a, a, a car, that we have a house. Like, so we look at the things we lack. And the Bible says, what you seek, you will find. And so today, my hope is that just this morning, that we magnify Christ. That we seek Christ with all our mind, our heart, our soul, our strength. And that we see him clearly in this place. And then we take him out. He's not a present to be kept inside a box. He's a gift to be shared. And so, Father, today, I pray we magnify the name of Jesus. And that the way we live, the way we think, the way we talk, the way we do things will be a reflection that we believe that every good gift is from you. So have your way, Holy Spirit. Speak as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, high five four people, just four this morning, and make one of them somebody you don't know and tell them God is good. Good morning, Vision. My name is Damien. I'm here hanging out in our new couch section and the fellowship hall. Look at this. That is nice. I'm here to tell you a couple things real quick. On August 18th, in two weeks, we will have our child dedication. Sign up your kids for that. If they're just a brand new born or if you've never had the chance to dedicate your child, this will be the beautiful and awesome time to do so. Then on that following Wednesday on the 21st, we will have a night of worship with some awesome food outside. Uh, we'll get to eat and gather and then worship together all night. And then on September 7th, our Foster Connect is having a movie night and we're looking for volunteers to help out with that. So if you have any questions or you're interested, go find Miss Carol Barosby. And if not, you can come to me and I will guide you to who you need to be. For anything else, go ahead and download our Vision app. All right. Well, we are in a series that we call the Sermon on the Mount, and let me just set it up really quick. I know most of you have been here. Some of you, this is your first time or you've missed a few weeks. You can go back on our app, our YouTube channel, and you can watch these messages. Um, my intent was probably to be done with the series by now, um, and then the Lord said, nope, you need to take your time. Um, and, and I didn't know he meant one, <laughs> one verse at a time, um, but it, at least through the Beatitudes, that's what we're doing, and uh, it's been really cool. And, and these first few verses are called the Beatitudes, and, and so Jesus is preaching, so when Jesus preaches, we better listen, and this is his first recorded sermon. So like, my first message, I remember when I, when I arrived at Vision in 2018, I really worked hard on it. I wanted to do the best I could. I, I wanted to make a good impression. And that's not why Jesus did this. Jesus came with a different agenda, a different motive. Because, see, the Jewish people, they, 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 they were being oppressed, and they weren't really free. They were under Roman oppression, but they were God's people, and they knew what the prophets had said and what the scriptures testified, that a savior was coming, that a king was coming, somebody that would be for them to help them, to give them a power. And they're waiting and longing generation after generation. And finally, Jesus comes onto the scene and says, hey, the king is here. I am he. And so the Jewish people in their mind, they have an idea of who Jesus is. He's probably going to be this mighty warrior. He's going to have, uh, perform all these miracles. The Romans, they're like, oh, who is this guy? And so Jesus says, okay, I'm going to preach a message, and here's the sermon. 
And so he goes onto the Mount of Beatitudes, is what it's called. And he starts saying, All right, listen, church. Do you want to know that you're going to be in the kingdom of God? Everybody's like, Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Do you want to be blessed? And when he said blessed, it's not just happy. It, it, it means fulfilled. It means at peace with God and peace with yourself and peace with everybody. And everybody's like, yes, I want that. And then he starts saying things that are countercultural. Like we say, blessed are those who have the most followers. <laughs> and Jesus would go, no, 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 no. Blessed are the meek, the ones who don't need attention. The ones who aren't trying to get the money. We, we say blessed are those who are rich in money. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Like you realize you have nothing to offer God. And so he's flipping the kingdom upside down. And then he gets to verse 8 and he says this. Blessed, we're all in, we want the blessed life, we want to be in the kingdom of God. This is what a citizen of heaven looks like. Blessed are the pure in heart. Because they're going to be the ones who can see God. Now, in order to understand this verse, we need to understand some words. Heart. Heart. Jesus was not saying blessed is the pure person who has a pure organ. That is the heart, where the blood is pumping. He's not talking about that. So when you, when you see pure in heart, it's not the organ. Some of you when, you, when I say heart, you think of feelings and emotions, right? Like you love somebody with all your heart. Or, or we say things like, follow your heart, right? The heart, the heart wants what the heart wants. But Jesus is talking about more than emotions, more than feelings. See, to G Jesus' audience, to the Jewish people that were there, and even the Romans that were around, and even the Gentiles, the heart is the center of who you are. It's why you think what you think. It's why you do what you do. It's your motives. It's your body. It's your, it's your mind. It, it, it's everything you are. In other words, the heart is the real you. You know the you that you don't want anybody to see? The you inside of you? That's the heart. Proverbs 27, 19 says it like this. As in water face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects the man. Your heart is who you are. And Jesus says, a citizen of my kingdom, a child of God, will be blessed if they are pure, not just on the surface, but at the source. Pure on the inside. So the question for us today is, how's your heart? How's your heart? Now, not physically, right? We're not talking about the organ. But let's do a heart checkup. Because that's what Jesus is getting at. How is your heart? And you know the problem when I ask this? We're people. And what do people do when, I, when we ask us to self-examine? We start comparing. Like you'll compare yourself to your spouse or your friends or the people in your life group or, or, or your people you work with. I'm, I'm here, aren't I? Right? And we'll, we'll start thinking of ways to validate our heart. The problem with comparing ourselves to people is that we measure ourselves against people who are inferior to us to make us feel better. A little bit of pride, don't you think? Like, I'm not going to measure myself up to somebody who's better than me because I will fall short. I won't be as good. I'll feel bad. The problem with comparing is that people are the standard. Right? That's why when we're, we're scrolling through and we're looking and we're longing, we're comparing our reels to everybody else's. And Jesus says, 
People are no longer the standard. God is. And, and at this time, this is a big deal. Because if I put you back in that time period, what was going on? Well, who was the standard? Yes, it was God, right? But God's standard was the law. The law. When I say the law, I, I, don't, I don't just mean Ten Commandments. I mean over six, 600 commands, regulations, if you will. That's the standard. Okay, so let me get this right. If my heart has to be right, and I need to compare myself to God, and God has set the standard, then I need to abide by all of the rules. Now, who's doing this the best at that time? It's the Pharisees. Do you know the Pharisees? They get a bad rap, and I understand why. But outwardly, these, these guys love God the most. No one would say otherwise. They were fasting the most. They were going above and beyond on their prayer life. They were serving at vision more than any of us. Like, you, you understand? I, want, I just want you to, to relate to this. The Pharisees, they preached better than any preacher you ever heard. They knew, they memorized, like, we struggle to memorize. Guys, they had, they had most of the book memorized. They didn't need to go back and, and say, because remember now, they didn't have their phones with the Bible on it, right? There were scrolls and ancient documents, and so, but these guys knew it, and so people would come to them. Why? Because those are the people who are right. Those are the people who are pure in heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, so when Jesus says, blessed are those who are pure in heart, these guys think Pharisees because they did it best. Here's the problem. Jesus calls out the Pharisees a lot, doesn't he? He uses this one word 17 times. Do you know what it is? Hypocrite. Well, how? I mean, they're singing on the worship team. They're, they're, they're preaching a message every Sunday. They're, they're leading a life group. I mean, I go to him, and he can quote scripture to me. No, like, why are they hypocrites? Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Here's just one instance where Jesus calls out the Pharisees. See, the the Pharisees and the scribes, verse 1, came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Okay, so picture this now. The Pharisees and the scribes, they are not happy with Jesus because Jesus is saying he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he is the king in God's kingdom. And the Pharisees are like, hold up. You're not preaching what we're preaching. And you're not even doing what we're doing. And so he, the Pharisees and the scribes, they come to Jesus and they say, hey, we've noticed that when you're eating, you guys aren't washing your hands before. Now, this is more than sanitary stuff. This is ritual purification. Becoming clean before you eat so you can be pure before God. Purity. And do you know what Jesus says to them? You go on and read. Look at verse 7. He looks at the Pharisees, the pure people, and he says, you hypocrites. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus calls the holy people, the right people, the ones who are the stand, like he calls them hypocrites. They're saying the right things. Do you know what a hypoc hypocrite is? Do you, do you know this word? Greek. It's Hypocrites. It means an actor. 
a stage player, one who hides behind a mask. And Jesus could not stand this. When there's a show on the outside, and then in their everyday life, it's something totally different. And, and Jesus talks about it a lot, right? He says, don't be like the Pharisees who will go and help out the Alran family and then tell everybody about it and they'll post about it. And it was a good gesture and the Alrans appreciated it, but it, it doesn't matter how, how much we gave because the point was that we were seen. Jesus says, don't, don't give to be seen. He says, don't pray on the street corners to be heard and seen. You don't have to post about every spiritual act of God that happens in your life. It's good sometimes that the Holy Spirit says post something and share it. God will use that in a second. But you know those people who just over-spiritualize everything and are posting to be seen? Jesus says, mm -mm. don't do that. Don't be noticed. Don't, be, don't pray. Don't pray to be heard. You ever been in a prayer circle? And those, I mean, we got some mighty prayer warriors, but you just know when somebody's just praying to be heard. Jesus says, don't, don't be like that. Don't criticize somebody when you got your own junk that you're dealing with, you got this big old plank in your eye, and you're calling out somebody's speck. Whenever somebody took advantage of the poor, and Jesus hated that. that that's, that's why he said one time to the Pharisees and the religious leaders, he said, I see you tithing. I, I see you doing the things, but you lack justice. You lack mercy. Mercy. It'd be better if you did that as well as that. Because it was, it was a show. It was a show. Even in the church, right? Like in the temple, Jesus came in and flipped over the tables. If I was real bold, I would have flipped that right then. Flipped over the tables. Why? Because they were selling Sacrifice. They were making money off of what God says was holy. And the church today has done this. You enter the church and it's, it's all consumerism now. And I feel like Jesus would walk into most churches today and flip over the table and say, what are you doing? You bunch of hypocrites. Jesus, I don't believe, ever spoke more harshly than to hypocrites. Those who are putting on a show, wearing a mask. Emma, can you, can you bring this up here? You said you've never been an illustration before. Today's your day. Most people hide from being an illustration, not this girl. Hey, Emma. All right. Go over that way. That's good right there. Okay. Go ahead and put that on. See, some people come to church like this. And they're the angry Christian. They're the angry Christian. They're quick to point out all the struggles in everybody's life. Just point at people. Yeah, look at you. Who are you pointing at? You pointing at Stephanie? Look at you, Stephanie. So prideful. Who, who else? Who, look at you. You're new to the church. You, you don't belong here yet. And like, like, like. And so this is an angry Christian. Can you, and she'll go and she'll gossip, go gossip, go gossip about people. And can you believe this? Yes, I can't believe it. And all the time, and then she'll go home. And she'll make you feel bad. She'll, 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 you'll, she'll be right. Like, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't have posted that, Lily. There's no way you should have posted that. You love God. Why would you post that? You need to take it down. And Lily feels compassion, and she does. And then later, she just goes home, and she she posts the same thing or DMs the same thing. This is, she's just wearing a mask. 
Or, or maybe you wear a mask and you're the happy, you ever meet the happy Christian? It's, they're so fake too. Come on up here. And, and you're like, hey, good morning. And, and the person with the mask, oh, I'm blessed, brother. I'm highly favored. Life is amazing. There is nothing going on, no sin in my life. And they just drove here cussing out the people on the road, having fights with their, their spouse, you know. But hey, life is great, man. And they've been crying because they lost their job. And they're the fake Christian. They're not real. They're putting on a mask. And this is what the Pharisees did. Thank you. Yeah, you can wear it. Go on down there. I might need you again. The Pharisees are saying, Jesus, why aren't you doing the right stuff? Why aren't you washing your hands? Remember, this is what he was saying in Matthew 15. And then verse 18, Jesus says, look, it ain't about hand washing. It ain't about all the rules. The rules are in place for a reason, by the way. I'm not dismissing the rules. I'm not abolishing the rules. I'm fulfilling the rules. And he goes on in verse 18, he says, what comes out of your mouth proceeds from where? Your heart. And this is what defiles a person. For out of the heart come your evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. That's what defile a person. It's our heart. Listen, our heart is what causes us to sin. It is our heart. It is not because of all the stuff around you. It is, not because, it is coming from your heart. Ultimately, Jesus is saying this. It doesn't matter what your hands do or what your head knows if your heart's not pure. Who you are on the inside matters more than what you show everybody on the outside. My concern is that we've become a generation of Christians who know how to put on a show. We know how to get likes and clicks, and follows, and that boys and praise. But how's your heart? How's your heart? I believe it's really easy to clean up on the outside. Some of you, some of you do this very well. You clean up on the outside really well. And you come to church and you serve and you participate in life groups and you do the work. You do the show. But on the inside, you're miserable. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no contentment. There's no longing for God. That's why Jesus, he calls the Pharisees hypocrites. He says in Matthew 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. There it is again. You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of extortion and rapacity. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and, and of the plate, that the outside may also be clean. Um, my wife gets mad at me. Y'all judge me, you already have. But when we do dishes, I like to wash by hands. She likes to throw them in the dishwasher. Um, I don't know why. But sometimes, maybe frequently, she'll look and say, does this look clean to you? This happened yesterday. Does this look clean to you? I said, yes. I look. She said, look inside. It was not clean. So I gladly cleaned it again. Can you imagine drinking from a cup where the outside is pretty, beautiful, but the inside is unclean? Now here's the truth. We can't do anything about our hearts. You cannot clean your heart. It's bad news. You can't make it pure. It's why some of you are just struggling so much with God. Because you are trying your best. 
You're trying your best. You're doing, you're helping, you're serving, you're coming. You're... But in the end, you can't change your heart. And Jesus says, blessed are the people who have a pure heart. So we got we to take a step back. Is this even possible? Like, none of us are perfect. You're going to fail. Is it possible to have a pure heart? Because don't you know this about yourself? You're going to sin. Here's the good news. Purity of heart is not sinlessness in life. See, when you see pure in heart, you might think perfect. You, you might think sinless, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. How do I know? Look at David. Do you remember David? What does God call him? A man after God's own heart. His heart was pure. His heart was righteous. Why? Is it because he was sinless? Absolutely not. David did stuff that you've not done. David killed someone. I pray that none of you have. David... Put him on the front line to kill him. Why? Because he committed adultery. He lied about it. Like David was the chief of sinners. In fact, that's what Paul says he is. But Paul has a pure heart. Why? David knew this about himself. You, I think many people are feel like David, and we struggle with who we are because of our sin, because of our past, because of our presence, because of our thought life, and we struggle with this thought of purity. How can God accept me? I, I understand it, I've heard it, Chris, but like I feel this way. David felt this way too. He, one time he was going to the temple of God. Remember now, the temple of God is where the presence of God was, and he was going to the feast in Jerusalem. And he was excited, but as he got closer to the presence of God, as he got closer to the temple, he asked what we all ask. Psalm 24, 3, he says this, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? In other words, how am I going to stand before God Almighty? Because I know who I am. I'm an adulterer. I, 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 I'm a murderer. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a, I, I, I lust. I look at pornography. I have an addiction problem. I, you go, I'm, I'm greedy. I'm a gossip. And I've got to come to church, and I've got to be in God's house with God's people in the presence of God. I feel like trash. This is what David was saying. How can I even approach God? You feel like that? You ever feel like that? I feel like that a lot because I know who I am. And then David says this, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. David knew that it was only God that could purify his heart. What does that word purity mean? What does pure mean? Because if we can define pure, then maybe we have a chance to be pure before God. If Jesus says that blessed are those who are pure in who we are, in our core, and it doesn't mean sinlessness, what does it mean? Purity. It means this, to cleanse from filth and impurity. And then this word right here at the end is the focus. Undivided. Undivided. Divided, an undivided heart, focused on one thing, single-minded, the Bible says, not distracted, loyal, not fake. A pure heart has been made clean and is undivided. So if we need a pure heart, but we can't make it clean, what do we do? I'm gonna give you three things that scripture says. Like, we all want to be blessed, and we all wanna make sure that our heart is pure, so what do we do? Here's the first thing, get a new heart. 
you can't cleanse your heart, so you need a new heart, right? Like if your heart is bad physically, then you need a heart transplant. Let me tell you, spiritually, you need a heart transplant. You need a new heart, a brand new heart. Why? Because all of us are sinners. We have a sin nature. It is what we, we have a propensity to go towards sin. Right? Don't you know this about yourself? Especially when you're alone, especially when it's quiet, especially when times are hard, you will gravitate towards sin. Your eyes will, your ears will, your mind will. We, we will gravitate towards sin. And because of sin, the Bible says, we are eternally separated from God. And the wages of sin is death. This is why there is death on the earth, because of sin. Whose sin? All of our sin. Not one of us are perfect. We all fall short, right? So we need to do something about our heart, but we can't. So we need a new heart. We need a donor. Oh, we need a donor. The problem is all people are sinners. So God sees this and says, okay. I see them. They've been trying for so long, doing their own thing. So I'm going to do something that nobody else can. And I'm going to make a way when there is no way. And I'm going to send Jesus Christ to the earth, the Son of God, 100% God, 100% man. And he's going to be their donor. And that's what happened. Listen, that's, don't just hear that. That is a historical event. That is a fact. And Jesus Christ lived on the earth, and not one time did he sin. Not once. Because he was perfect. He was the standard. And so sin requires sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. And so Jesus went to the cross willingly in your place as your sin, right? If you're hearing this and you're like, I've heard this before, how can you hear that and think that? Because you put him there, and so did I. Every time we sin, this is what he died for because of his love. And he died a death that I deserved and that you deserved just so that you would receive a new heart. So how do I do that? How do I do that? Romans 10, 9. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's the word. Not just real. Not just the Son of God. That he's Lord. That he is master of your life. That he controls. He calls the shots. It is his way. He is your Savior. He is your Messiah. If you declare with your mouth, if you say it, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead three days later, he came back to life to prove he was God. You will be saved. And what I love is that Paul, look at that. Paul didn't say, if you believe in your head. I know you've heard it. And I know you know it. But when push comes to shove, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Like, like Job, if everything was taken from you, everything, can you just put yourself, your family gone, your job gone, your security gone, every, all you got's God, would you still believe it? That's what it means to believe in your heart. And the reason he didn't say believe in your head is because even the demons believe. You don't think the devil knows 
that Jesus is real? Of course. What's the difference between me and the... Di the difference is I believe that Jesus is my Lord. I, I, I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I, I believe the Father raised him from the dead. I, I believe that... That his blood, his sacrifice has washed me and cleansed me and purified me. And my whole life now, listen, here's, here's the proof. My whole life now is oriented around that. Focused on that. And the Bible says now I am brand spanking new. I got a new heart. I've been born again. Remember when Nicodemus was meeting with Jesus? He says, well, how do I get it be in, in God's kingdom? And Jesus looks at him and says, you've got to be born again. Nick, Nick is like, what? Well, how can I be born again? And, and Jesus was talking about your new heart. That's why the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 36 says, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Listen to me, some of you today, this is the message. You've been playing church, you've been wearing the mask, you, you do everything for show. You got followers, you got channels, you, you like to pray for people, you do all, you serve mightily, you're, you're doing all the right things, but you don't believe in your heart. It hasn't made a difference inside. And today's invitation is for you to give up Take off the mask and say, here I am. I am yours. I believe that Jesus is Lord. And I know God raised him from the dead in my heart. That's your message today. You say, what do I do? I just told you. Confess that Jesus is Lord and believe and you will be saved. doesn't matter your past. You need a new heart. Because when that happens... I remember when I was 14 at Camp Caswell, that happened for me. And in that moment, Jesus washed me white as snow and I became positionally pure. Positionally. That means when I die, I'm in eternity with Jesus. You ask, I ask these people all the time, how do you know you're going to get to heaven? Well, I've done a lot of good things. I try to help people. I just feel God. I, know, I go to church. I do... None of that gets you to heaven. None of that makes you right before God. It is a brand new heart. You need a heart transplant. Today, that's your wake-up call. Do it. Surrender. Give up your life. The only reason you can make it to heaven is because the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, His sacrifice. That's it. You need a new heart. And you'll become positionally pure. And here's the struggle but I still sin. You feel that? I still sin. And I want to tell you, yup, you're just like Paul. I do the things I know I shouldn't do, I don't want to do, but I keep doing the same stupid stuff. Anybody feel me on that one? Like I keep doing this, gosh, and I know that it's wrong, and I know I shouldn't, and I, I, but I just keep going back to it over, and, uh, and, I, and I turn, and I put up, I just keep, why do I do this? Because we're sinners. This is a reminder that we need saving, not just eternally, we need saving from ourselves every single day. And, and here's the proof that you're born again. You wanna know how you know if you're pure? When you pursue sin, how's the inside, okay? You with me? So when you sin, is there conviction? Is there repentance? Is your heart longing to obey God? It's your heart. That's how you know. It's not are you perfect. It's are you longing for God? Do you wake up wanting to know? Are you, are you repentant of your sin? Is there mourning over it? Are you broken over it? Do you come to the altar? Like, I know that's just, a, and I'm not talking about for show. I mean, when's the last time in God's house that you've been broken over someone or something or your sin that you have fall to your face? That's just not my personality. Praise God, you're a brand new person. Like, some of you, are loving sin way too much. You need a heart check. 
Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. But can I give you, give you some encouragement? Because that's really strong. Listen to this verse. I don't know if you've heard this. Hebrews 10, 14. For by that one offering, Jesus, forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Just, just, just think about this. Right now, you and I are being made holy. Right now. You're positionally pure, right? As a child of God, you've got heaven. Positionally pure. On earth, far from perfect, right? But the good news is that Jesus died knowing that, and he's still perfecting you right now. You've, we've been made perfect forever, but we're being perfected right now on earth. Don't wallow in your sin. Grieve over it, mourn over it, but don't wallow in it. I keep falling. Yeah, get up, righteous man. Seven times, over and over. Yeah, but I keep, yeah, yeah, okay. Let's put some things in place. Let's do the second thing. See, most of you have a new heart. Here's the second thing. Guard your new heart. This is where we struggle. Guard your heart. The wisest man to ever live, other than Jesus, the wisest man, King Solomon, says this. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. That's Proverbs 4.23. Above anything else, above, I know you want the promotion. I know you want more money. I know you want a family. I know you want a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I know you want, want whatever it is that you're longing for, but, but the wisest person. And by the way, the richest person to ever live says above anything else, you better guard your heart. Translation, be in the world, not of it. Whew. Can I see that mask? I think we got too many Christians who are trying to love the world. We're loving the world. And then on Sundays or at group or even at night and morning time during our devotions, we're trying to love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. And then we go out and we live the way that we want to what makes sense in our brains, the way we want to do things. We control our lives. But I love Jesus. He's the Lord. We're wearing a mask. Guard your heart. This is what was happening when James wrote his letter to the church. And in chapter 4, they were, guys, listen to me. Can, I, can, we, can we be family for a minute? Some of us are. I, I need to be very real and speak very clearly. I honestly care about you. Okay, Whether you know me or not, every person in here, whether I know you, I care about you. I care about your soul. I care about your life. I care. I want you to experience all God has for you. I want your families to be prosperous. I want you to enjoy, taste, and see that God is good. I want you to, I want you to have an abundant, full life, okay? I, I, you can take that for what it's worth, but that is my heart's desire for you. I want to teach you the ways of the Lord. I'm not perfect, but I am called to be a pastor. And, and so I want that for you. And every time, every time you start pursuing sin and you start flirting with sin, when you start longing for acceptance from others or from the world or, or from validation from somebody or identity, whatever it is, okay, when you start doing this, 
and you start trying to love the things of the world and love God, do you know what God calls you? It's what James wrote. It, it, it's very harsh. Are you ready? James chapter 4. Look at this verse. You adulterers. You adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? When you are longing for more stuff and working so hard to accumulate stuff, we were given work, by the way. Work is a form of worship. And yes, it feels great to buy things and have things and do things, and we should enjoy those things as so long as the good things don't become God things. And so... When you are longing for the pleasure of the world, listen to me, some of you are sleeping around and you are married. Some of you are sleeping around and you're not married. Both are wrong. You are physically having adultery, but you're also spiritually having adultery. Some of you are robbing God. You are not generous. You will not give to God. You have been hurt, and so you don't trust him. People hurt you, not God, and so you hold back. And because it doesn't make sense to you. Of course not. How are you not seeing that God's kingdom doesn't make sense to the world? We're longing for acceptance. Some of you are longing for a girlfriend, longing for a fiance or a husband, wanting so much a kid, and you want this because it gives you validation and identity and it makes you feel a certain way. And you, so you'll do anything. You'll say anything. You'll go anywhere. You'll post anything. Some of you, work trumps everything. You spend more time at work than you do anywhere else. Like, and this is just a few things. Some of you are just, we're just lazy. And we just want to sit around and watch the Olympics all day. We choose the things of the world so much, don't we? And James says, you adulterers. James's point is, listen, we are friends of God. We are sons and daughters of God. God wants an intimate relationship with you. He wants to know you and you to know him. And every time you choose other things or other people or what the world has to offer, some of you are getting validation from the way that you, you, you get dressed and you look. And like every time you do that, God says, why are you sleeping around on me? We gotta guard. This is so easy for us to do. But here's what blows my mind. Mandy and I have had this conversation. And I say, Mandy, <laughs> I'm letting you in a little bit. Mandy, if you ever cheat on me, I would probably take you back. I, I said that to you, right? I'll probably take you back. I mean, I, I'm a pretty forgiving person, to be honest. I have the mercy thing we talked about last week. I, I do that. I, God has, through his grace, given me that gift. Mandy, on the other hand, says, mm, I'm not so sure. And that's being polite, by the way. <laughs> so look, so look, I, I'm going to just do a show of hands for me. You can raise your hand if you want. I don't want you to raise your hand. But how many of us, according to that, have ever committed adultery on God? Have you, have you ever chosen the, th the ways of the world and the things of the world and habitually, like, wanted, sin like, I have. A lot. A lot. Now, what do I do with that? I can wallow. I can continue to, to sleep around. But when I read verse 6 of James chapter 4, there ain't no way I can continue to live that way. Because he says, but he gives more grace. You will never, you will never be able to sin more 
than God's grace can cover. Please breathe that in. Because some of you are wallowing and sulking and so ashamed and so hurting over sin that you committed long ago. But look, he gives more grace that has washed you clean. You are pure. Guard your heart. Here's the last thing. I'm done. Get a new heart. Guard it. How do we guard it? We gut what's competing for it. See, guarding is active. When he, when he said guard your heart, Solomon, he said take offense. Not defend. Yes, there should be the shield of faith. Yes, we should be extinguishing the fiery darts. We should be on the defensive. But let me tell you something. Sometimes when you guard things, you got to take action, right, Jake? Like if somebody comes in your house, I don't think Jake is just going to be back in the corner. Like I might be that way, but not Jake. Jake's, Jake's going to take some action to protect his family. So when we guard our hearts, we got to be proactive. we got to be ready to fight to do whatever it takes to take care of our purity practically. So what does that mean? Who are you listening to? Right now, right now, jot down, think about, take a note. Who are the three biggest influences in your voice and in your ears that are going speaking into you? Is it your family? Is it your boss? Is it social media influencer? Like who is it? Who are the three? What, word, what are you saying? What word's coming out of your mouth? Because out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Well, I just don't think cussing's wrong. Okay, that's fine. You got a problem, though, with the verse that says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Right? Which is how I grew up. Great. Christ gave you a new heart. And I'm not saying it's easy, but you got to gut it. Well, what do I got to do? You, you got to start surrounding yourself with people who don't, who don't want to be around that language and who will call you out in love, not to condemn, but, but, but to correct, right? What are you speaking? Some of you are, are not speaking words of life. You're speaking words of death to people. You're very judgmental. You're very critical. Some of you go home and you speak a totally different way than when you are out of the home. Like, guard your heart, gut the competition. Here's the big one. What are you looking at? There's a slide that, listen to me, this is probably one of the biggest ones today. There's a slide, I think, that's about to pop up. Please pop up. Yes. Okay. So this, listen to me. For lack, can we all do this so there's no embarrassment? What I'd like for everybody to do is hold up their phone. Okay? Hold up their phone and even put it on the camera. Okay? And and look at this QR code. And that way, just everybody do that. and, And then I'll tell you what this is really quick. Okay? Go ahead and get the link and pull it up and all that. It would be really good, really beneficial. Okay, covenant eyes. All right, now, stop looking at it just for a second. Look up. I won't be long. Ready? This will protect your phone, your laptops, any. Some of you struggle. And if you're okay with struggle, check your heart. Some of you, this is the accountability you've been waiting for. So put it on your kids' devices. Like this is, you gotta gut the, you gotta guard that heart. I'm telling you, the enemy's so sneaky good. And know where you stray. And what's the point? What's the point of all this? Why does this matter so much? Because Jesus says, blessed is the pure in heart. Why? Watch this because they will see God. Purity, purity of heart leads to clarity of God. Oh, this is going to be like mind-blowing for somebody. Some of you have been praying so long, and, and you can't hear, and you can't see, and you don't know, and you've been asking God, and asking God, and asking God, and where are you, God, and why won't you, God? Could it be? It's because... Your heart is not pure. 
maybe the thing you're longing for has replaced God. Maybe, maybe the way you want something or someone has become an idol that needs to be torn down. Maybe, look, it might be a good thing. Maybe the way that you long for healing has replaced the way you long for God. I'm just saying, if you want to see God, if you want to know God, if you want to hear from God, make sure your heart is pure, both positionally in heaven and practically here right now. God, we pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would move in this church. This is a message for all of us. This is not a message for some of us. And the reason I know this, God, is because none of us have arrived. None of us are perfect. We are being perfected. You are working out our sanctification, becoming more like Christ. And so today, in this moment, right now, God, I want you to speak to the Christians today. I want you to speak to the Christians who are flirting with sin, who are playing with sin, who are longing for things. God, I want you to open eyes to the Christians who, who don't even realize that they put idols before you. And today, I, I want us to, to make practical decisions, Father, to be pure on earth, to, to long for purity, to long for Jesus. So that's my prayer for you, Christians, that today you make some decisions. Some of you need accountability. You'll get signed up for a life group or a D group. Some of you need to fall on your face and repent. Some of you need to restore relationships with your family and with your friends or with your church members. Some of you have been longing for things that have replaced God. Today, Christian, is a call to repent. And don't dwell on your sin, but surrender it to Jesus. And then for you who have never believed in your heart, oh yeah, you know Jesus. You know about Jesus, you've been to church, but today your eyes are open and you know that without Christ, you are lost. Look, it is not good works that are going to get you to heaven. It is not doing all the good stuff that is going to make you be okay and right with God. It is only when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ that you confess that he is Lord and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead. The Bible says you will be saved. And I believe there's somebody here that needs to trust Christ with their life. If that's you, if you have never made a decision and said, hey, I give my life to Jesus. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. I want you to do that right now. It's your opportunity. Nobody looking around and say, hey, I need to be saved today. I realize I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. If that's you on the count of three, just slip your hand up. One, don't delay, don't miss out. Two and three. Say, I need Jesus today. I need Jesus today. Is there, I see you back there, yep. Anybody else? Anybody else say, I need Jesus. Jesus, save me. Okay, very good. Father, your will done, your way. We want more of you. In Jesus' name. Let's stand. This altar's open. Prayer team members will be here. If you need to pray with someone, I'll be right here. You do business with God, church.
washing my feet, covering me with your love. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take Father, I pray this church is a church that's on mission. That when we leave these doors, we leave this place, that our week is just beginning, and we have been filled up so that we can pour out. I pray the Holy Spirit fills us today to do your work. Empower us today to live for you. I pray that we are actively tearing down any idols that try and 
that try and stop us from worshiping the true and the living God. Thank you for this church. Thank you for what you're doing. And we praise you for Jesus in Christ's name. Amen. Church, we got breakfast right out here to the left. I hope you have an amazing week. I want to tell you that we have a new place we're working on that's behind here. So if you want to stay a little bit, you grab your food and you go back there a little bit, worship, hang out, fellowship. I love you, church. God bless you. Go be the church we're called to be.